Yes, fine, we are now live. The meeting is now live, Chair. Brilliant. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Cabinet Procurement Committee. Um, this September, uh, I'm scanning the notes to make sure, as Clifford was saying uh, just before we started, we've all got quite relaxed about doing virtual meetings, but we do have to make sure we read out certain things at the start of every meeting to comply with the rules. Um, so, my role to remind everyone that it's been live streamed and then uh, just scanning. So, just to let everyone know, I don't think we actually have any of the press in attendance tonight. I'm going to on the live stream. Um, I to attend, Chair, but um, whether they will, I, I, they haven't confirmed. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. So I'm just scanning the notes to see what we need to say in terms of the meeting being held in public. Obviously, we're doing it virtually. It's live stream for public viewing. We uploaded after the meeting, um, and we may need to ask the person public to leave if we want to discuss any of the appendices. Is that it? For my side preferred to run through. That's fine, Chair. Your mic, you, you are, Chair, if I could suffice, you're going off slightly um, with your microphone. Um, but I'm not always catching it, but I'm sure everyone else is in main, but just be my connection. Um, if I could just run through the protocols for remote meetings, I know that members and some officers are aware of the protocols, but we do need to remind everyone at the start of every formal meeting. Um, if I could ask that when members or officers are speaking, if they can speak when invited to by the chair. If you wish to speak, if you could raise your hand and then direct any communications I've said through the chair. Um, can you please make sure that your mics are muted uh, when you're not speaking apart from the chair? And um, that's to ensure that the meeting is effectively conducted. When speaking, please be succinct and please speak slowly. And if you're referring to a page or a paragraph, please refer to the page number or if it's a diagram, then a diagram, please, and make that clear so that people that are following are, are clear of where, where they are. Um, if you're having any te te technical difficulties, if you use the chat bar, which is the little screen in the right hand corner, um, and Mario will pick that up and will try to attempt to assist you for IT purposes. So please do not use the, back, the chat um, bar for um, any other um, general chit chat during the meeting. And just finally, um, if there is any persistent disruptive behaviour, this would result in a person being removed from the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Brilliant. Thank you, Clifford. Um, and we don't normally do uh, introductions at the start of this meeting, um, but just to let uh, those who are part in today's meeting know that I'm joined uh, tonight by Sharon, who's doing some work shadowing. Um, with myself, we've done a few meetings and we'll hopefully fit in a few more once exams are out of the way over the next few weeks. Um, and I won't embarrass you by making yourself say hello as we're now on the live stream, although you're very welcome if you do want to jump in. Um, but yeah, so it'd be great if uh, both officers and members could introduce themselves when they talk. So uh, Sharon's got that context. Um, and Sharon, please just, uh, flag at any point. It would be helpful if we explained what's, what's going on. Um, right, I think we're ready to start the main body of the meeting. So, apologies for absence. I'm not aware we've got any, unless Clifford, do you have any? No, Chair. We have no items of urgent business. Does mm -hmm. anyone have any interest they need to declare? Take that as a no. Uh, we have no notice of intention to conduct business in private. We have no questions or petitions. One day we will receive one, I'm sure. Um, can we agree, can I ask members to agree the unrestricted minutes of the Cabinet Procurement Committee held on the Bye. Agree. 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 Unless obviously you disagree or have amends. Agreed. Brilliant. And take those as passed. Um, Item seven, uh, request to access Wolf and Forest Framework for Supported Living Services for People of Learning Disabilities, Mental Health and Autism Disabilities. And we should have Penny here to introduce the report. 
Hello, good evening. Um, I'm Penny Heron. I'm a Joint Commissioner for Learning Disabilities, so I look at services for people with learning disabilities and try and make sure they're good. Um, this paper requests the permission from Cabinet to call off the London Borough of Walden Forest framework once it's in place. Um, Walden Forest are going to procure a supported living services framework for those with learning disabilities, uh, physical disabilities and or mental health needs. They previously did this before for learning disabilities and now they've sort of branched out a bit more into other care groups and they've also applied London Living Wage to it which makes it a bit more attractive for us too. So for us in Hackney at the moment we purchase most of our provision through spot purchasing arrangements so this framework will actually give us more options to be able to um, access a wider variety of placements and providers who will already have been vetted through the formal process of applying to be on the framework um, and it will also provide some consistent prices too. Uh, the services themselves support people within their own homes, um, so the providers work with individuals who have um, disabilities in order to try and promote independence and other similar outcomes like that. Um, I've outlined the benefits on the paper um, and that's covered in sort of sections 1.9 to 5. Point one, um, but basically this includes things like cross borough working, uh, which for us in learning integrated learning disability services is really beneficial because it also includes some of the other partners within the integrated care system who come under the STB, so the Sustainability and Transformation Partnership um, footprint. Um, it's as an estimated value we've identified three million over the four years of life of the framework and that's been based on some numbers that we've been working with in the past in terms of those coming through and we have various sort of permutations within that so we could have higher cost and low numbers of placement but we could also use it for um, a wider number of placements um, at low cost um, it, um, there's no obligation we don't need to call off it ultimately we can still commission our own it's just another option to have um, and if we are um, granted uh, approval to participate in this uh, we will be um, involved on the tender panel so assessing the quality side of the bids um, that's it thank you Brilliant, thank you. I know I've got a few questions, um, although, Clifford, can I just check you have problems with my sound previously? Is that okay now? It's okay. Um, yeah, it's better. I'll ask, uh, do any colleagues want to come in with questions first? I was going to say Councillor Selman, I thought I saw your hand. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, no, it was just two quick questions. One was um, just on, I'm sorry if I missed this, the ceiling rates for one and two, so understanding how they would be determined. The Sorry, it's looking like I might be, uh, am I coming through okay? Yeah, so just the ceiling rate. Um, and then the other thing was, there's a reference uh, to the fact that Wilson Forest was working with Health Watch, um, with Health Watch uh, ensure user voice. I just wanted to check whether that would include the user voice within the process. Thanks. Okay, so um, in terms of the ceiling rates for lots one and two, that was done with quite a lot of work with the market um, side of things that Walden Forest did at the start. So they, they basically tried to, to work through with the market, look through the number of rates, worked out the sort of price breakdown that there was. And also in terms of the level of need, oh, excuse me, that was being used under the lots. So um, for example, lot one, they put a ceiling rate of, I think, £17.15, whereas lot two, they put it as 19.05. That's because in lot two, you might need a little bit more expertise than you would do in lot one, where you're working with maybe milder, lower needs groups. Um, so they've based that very much on the, the market feedback that they got around that. Um, in terms of the engagement side of things, um, I think, yes, if we want to have um, users sort of engaged on the panel, if we get the permission to go ahead with this, we can definitely look at that through probably our health watch would make the most obvious sense as well. We can definitely put that to Walden Forest. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We can see if Councillor Burke or Dr. Bramble have any questions. I'm going to no, thank you, oh. Chair. From me. 
Um, I had uh, a few questions uh, which have sort of been touched on uh, in the introduction, but it'd be good and clarified for the notes. Um, I'm going to ask a really basic question to start with to check I'm reading the paper right. Is this really low numbers? Because when I look at page, I think it's 23 in the paper, 33 in the pack uh, with the finances. Um, that would suggest it's just seven placements. Potentially. So that kind of works on the different permutations that you might have. So on average, in something like learning disabilities, they make maybe 10 placements a year. And that can really range. So sometimes that depends on the level of needs, etc. So what you could have is seven placements at a higher cost, potentially. Or what you could do is have maybe, say, I don't know, 10 placements a year and use, say, lots one and two and have a lower number. So this was based really on the sort of average spend that we have per year and also the average number of placements. So you're right, it's not probably an awful lot of placements really so presumably coming to cabinet procurement committee because of the cost of those placements and that we're entering a formal agreement with Wolf and Forest rather than spot purchasing yeah and it might also be partly the vulnerability of the users too I guess because some of them will be quite vulnerable uh, so I'm going to stick to my theme of asking more or maybe obvious questions um, but just Again, it's, it's sort of alluded to, but just to be clear, why the Wolf and Forest model in particular um, and, and why now, I guess, it would be useful to know where this sits in terms of our overall vision for these services. Um, I suppose I'm just aware that because it's a framework and because it's low numbers, there can be a tendency just to pass, you know, pass it through without questioning a bit more. But when I think of comparable contract awards, We've gone into quite a lot of detail about how they fit into wider plans for the service and, and so forth. So it'd be good to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, so um, this doesn't preclude us from commissioning our own by any means. So we can still go ahead and do that if we wish to. Um, what this does offer us, though, is, I suppose, a sort of a partnership working. So we're kind of sharing, I suppose, resources, thoughts, etc., across um, somebody who's also hopefully going to be as part of our, our wider um, health and care partnership in future too. So um, I suppose in some ways you, you get maybe um, a better kind of partnership cross borough working so the consistency around the prices will be there as well. At the moment how it tends to work is we might be doing our own spot placements and that's done very much an individual basis which is fine and that's good because you're offering bespoke services to individuals this is another way of doing it so an alternative way of doing it but it also means then you have a, a sort of more compliance in terms of uh, a service schedule that covers uh, the wider uh, contract and con terms and conditions as well as the individual placement agreement so you almost have that benefit of joining that wider framework with more numbers so more competition as part of it um, in terms of with learning disabilities, what you can find as well, just as an example, is sometimes you will get people placed across the borough and that's to do with the services available. We do want to try and make sure that there's services close to home where we can. Um, but there might be some cases where we have to place them out. And I think, you know, especially with things like challenging behaviour where um, it, it's maybe more specialist, this gives us a bigger opportunity to, to sort of scope that out on a wider area, but still quite close to home because it's a neighbouring borough as well. Does that make sense? Sorry, has that answered your yeah, question? Yeah, that, that, that's helpful. Um, how does that fit into sort of our longer term plans? So you say short term, it doesn't prevent us from looking at developing more services in borough. W would we have a time frame for that? Again, just very aware when we've discussed similar measures with other contracts, it's sort of been, well, this might be in place for X number of years whilst we build up our own services or develop the market or, or similar things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think we're currently looking at what we do want to do with regards to um, supported living services as a whole and what we can look at as well as do we want to do our own thing across care groups and what's going to be the most feasible to get the best value really um, at, at kind of a, a level that, that makes sense from a resource point of view but also offers a good personalised service. So um, I, I think that is that is something we're still looking at and we will still continue to look at that across the care groups at this moment. So, yeah. 
And, uh, and sorry, I, I'd like, I, it's nice to know, isn't it? The councillors have read the papers, but then frustrating because we, we come with lots of questions. But it was um, a question about uh, the timing of this as well, because obviously Wolf and Forest has started the process of the tender process um, framework, but not finished it. You've sort of explained why it works now coming in because we can be part of the assessment process. Um, when they went out to providers at the outset, were they clear this could be a framework that would apply to multiple boroughs and that Hackney would be part of that? In, are we hoping the framework would include providers that will offer in borough provision uh, for our own residents so we won't send a few people to forest? Um, yeah, sorry, you broke up just a bit at the end, so I'll see if I can answer. No, I'll see if I can answer there, nonetheless. So yes, you're right. It's about at this moment in time they're going out to procurement, so there will be obviously. Um, it might be more attractive for some providers to think, well, we'll bid into a framework where there's a wider pool of people who are going to want to be calling off it. So I think that's one element of it for sure. Um, so it will make it more attractive to, to the providers. So at the start, I think uh, Walden Forest had sort of asked, were we interested around um, joining the framework, et cetera. Um, and I think we were trying to make sure that it was more or less just right for us before we, we sort of did it and jumped in with it. So trying to do some of that scoping work that we were doing, first of all, to make sure we were happy to join it. And yes, at this moment in time, they're going out and what we're trying to do is, so they've, they've also included us in terms of things like some of the, um, the questions they might be asking from a quality perspective too. And then what will happen is, is once they get the bids in, we can be involved in um, assessing that and on the tender panel as part of saying, well, actually, you know, who, who we think should come on the framework. And hoping my internet connection lasts. Um, just um, within that, the bit where I think the connection broke up was around, we, we're hopeful that it will offer provision within Hackney through this. It won't just, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we should be able to use it for providers in the borough as well. That's fine. Brilliant. In which case, you'll be pleased to know that's the end of my notes of <laughs> things I wanted to check. Um, I'm assuming there's nothing coming in from colleagues. Um, in which case, if everyone's okay to uh, unmute and agree the recommendations are set out. We have a chorus of agreed. 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 Perfect. Thank agreed. you all. Thank you, Penny. Thank you. Thank um, you. As always, welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. Also, welcome to go. <laughs> so, just call my notes up. So, next up, we have the single homeless single homeless pathway service, um, and we should have Beverly here to introduce the report. Hello. Um, we're seeking approval to award a directly negotiated contract for the single homeless rough sleep provision. Um, the contract will run for a term of five years with the option for two annual extensions. The five-year value will be £6 million um, with £8.5 million if we run for the full seven years. The service will deliver support to 172 homeless people which represents an increase of 47 units compared to previous provision. This increase is added value and at no additional cost to the council. The service will deliver housing related support to adult singles who have, who are homeless, sorry, who have a range of support needs, multiple and complex needs that includes entrenched rough sleeping, mental health, undiagnosed, um, personality disorders and substance misuse. The support journey will be phased using the um, pathway model where people enter at the assessment stage. They may progress through the engaging support stage and leave the pathway after they complete um, the move through stage. The journey doesn't have to be linear. You can access the um, pathway journey at any stage, depending on um, what skills you bring, what assets you bring, because it is a, an asset-based model. Um, really, that's it, I think, for me. 
happy to field any questions from you. Brilliant. Thank you, Beverly. Do we, any questions from colleagues? Councillor Selman. Thanks, and thanks, Beverly. Um, no, two questions for me. One was you mentioned about the additional 47 beds provision. And I was just wanting to understand a bit more how that had been achieved without sort of cost consequences, but without ensuring sort of any compromise on quality of support for individuals. And then the other question was just, um, as I understand from this in previous briefings, the reason that we're going out for, um, for down the directly negotiated route is due to the challenges about finding somewhere which can just accommodate uh, the provision that we're looking for. But I guess that puts additional focus on how we're then ensuring the quality of the provision and that it's meeting needs. So it'd be useful as well. Perhaps you could just speak to that a bit further as well. That'd be really great. Thanks. Okay, so um, our support journey, our um, SHRS pathway journey is based on three stages, um, assessment, engaging, support and move through. Um, the additional 47 units actually represents move on. So um, the pathway, the success of a pathway relies on churn. And um, I think we know the accommodation is at a premium. In Hackney, um, the current provider brought these additional 47 units to us. Um, I suppose they had stock in Borough because of um, commissioning decisions that were made in the past, I suppose. So they, they had um, this additional 47 units that will be used for move on. So move on from the um, pathway. At no additional cost to us because it will utilize an enhanced housing management um, model. So the housing management support that they receive will be funded through housing benefit. And so that's the rationale behind that. We will ensure quality because enhanced housing management will be delivered by the current incumbent, the provider who has oversight of the whole pathway um, even though we're not funding those additional units we will monitor um, we'll monitor performance we'll monitor quality of the provision within those 47 units and we'll keep an eye on how well it's um, supporting churn throughout the pathway does that make sense or would you like me to expand on that so just, so just to check, I'm clear. So essentially, there it's 47 bed space that the provider had already, and which um, we'd be able to access. We presumably would have been able to access in a way outside of this, and, and the funding for that is via housing benefit rather than via additional committing within. So the, the incumbent, um, as well as being a support provider, they have significant stock in Hackney. It's their accommodation. Um, and I think that we're very lucky because they've given it to us as opposed to taking referrals from across London. Um, so again, additional value in as much as it um, representing move on um, for the pathway. So it's their property, but they've gifted it to us. And then just on the, the broader point, which is about quality, where uh, just across the board, regardless of the 47, but um, in terms of it being a directly negotiated contract. Do we have a sense of, you know, when we look to perhaps um, provision elsewhere or our understanding of, of how it's currently functioning, right. do we yeah. currently feel confident that, that what is being provided is, is, is the best we would want, recognising the limitations and restrictions in terms of yeah. the market, as it were, gotcha. that we are confident they're providing yeah. the support we would want to see to potentially I, vulnerable people? Yeah, I, I, th I think um, we can be confident um, we've had a look at best practice across the sector and we've actually relaunched um, the service. So in as much as we've devised a new service spec, um, we've incorporated elements that we know bring um, improved outcomes to our service users and will ultimately improve their ability to engage and to uh, um, engage with um, broader society. So for example, we have created an approach that utilizes um, a recovery and asset based approach. 
um, we've asked our provider to deliver support in a way that is psychologically and trauma informed. Um, and also, we've just stepped up the way that we collect our performance outcomes information. So instead of focusing on outputs, we're focusing on person centered outcomes. We've, um, in partnership with the provider, we've identified outcomes that are relevant to the service user and we've set targets against key outcome areas. So, for example, this particular cohort, we know that they are very far from engaging with health services. That's a key area where we've identified outcomes and we've set relevant targets. Um, similarly, just improving their life skills to uh, live independently. So engaging with employment training and education services, um, just basic um, uh, tenancy, preparing for tenancy. So one of our expectations as you move through the pathway is that you engage and participate in um, pre-tenancy training and it's all of those types of areas that ultimately will it, um, enable people to live independently those are the areas that we're monitoring and we know that this approach works because we've looked at the rest of the sector and that's an approach that the area is using thanks can I talk about the um, accommodation or are you happy with that? Because you did ask about why we went the um, direct negotiation route. Uh, yes, no, it's fine. Yeah. Oh, well, right, sorry, do the chair. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's fine, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Okay, well, we went the direct negotiation route because this provider is not just the provider they're a landlord, they have a significant um, footprint in the borough, and if we don't negotiate directly with us, then we are vulnerable to um, homeless people being imported into the borough. So that's the rationale behind the direct negotiation. Is it worth, we've touched on it a bit from the quality side as well, but it is a unique position and obviously this is an unusual report because we name who we're awarding the contract to up front in the report um, mm. although clifford would nudge me right now if i didn't flag the exempt appendices that we have to wait to the exempt part of the meeting if we want to discuss and um, it is a unique position to have a provider that obviously has large premises to deliver the service in question in in a borough like Cackney, where it's not always easy to have sites like that if it were just no, and there was a cost mm. process as well, wasn't there, to ensure that the contract, as well as delivering quality, is delivering value yeah. for money. And we did. That was also part of the benchmarking, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we collected um, information across uh, several local authorities, London local authorities, and um, I think we sit right in the middle, actually, with regards um, value for money and um, unit costs. So we know that. Um, we do anticipate ongoing quality support um, provision from the provider, but also, yes, um, they're still competitively priced and even more so with the additional units. Does that answer your question, Councillor Solomon? Can I just ask a question? Um, so, um, uh, to do with the organisation, to do sit mongers themselves. Mm. And I'm aware we're restricted within the sustainable procurement strategy to the extent to which we can, uh, we can't mandate, but we can strongly encourage our providers to engage with trade unions. And I am aware there's been strike action at St. Mm. Mongers um, yeah. in recent months. And I think it's mm. just, I think it'd be wrong for this report to go through and us both not note that. Yes. Um, as far as we can in encouraging St. Mungo's to engage with trade unions yeah. uh, within the legal restrictions we, we have to operate yeah. in within yeah. procurement. Um, and yeah. also given the concerns of workers in terms of um, having staff delivering services at the appropriate level of experience and training, um, we've been reassured on that point in terms of the services in Hackney. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a really fair point, isn't it? And and um, we've seen industrial action in pretty quick succession, haven't we, really, um, in Hackney and just across uh, 
that particular organization. But um, we do have a good relationship with St Mungo's and I, I think it would be fair for us to just reinforce our expectations around um, equity amongst staff and for staff to have the um, option of uh, being unionized and um, yeah, for management to speak to staff before we do escalate to industrial action. And I think given the uh, huge amount of work that's gone in in the coronavirus response as well, it would be it's only right for us to acknowledge, just as we have acknowledged the work of our own staff at Hackney in helping rough seeds at this time, that St Mungo's staff is being part of that um, mm. front line and just that, yeah, we want to do everything we can uh, to recognise their commitment and so, yes, we strongly encourage uh, St Mungo's to engage with the unions to find a way of resolving the, the ongoing dispute. Yeah. Um, you know, do you know can can I ask you a question there? Yeah. That's a really fair point that you've just raised. Um, how would we as a council go about raising that with the provider? So within our sustainable procurement strategy, we set mm. out around, so we're not allowed legally to mandate union recognition, but we make it clear within it, we expect, um, we expect and we strongly encourage everyone we contract with to recognise trade unions. And mm. I think it's, quite reasonable as part of that contract management for us to um, acknowledge there's an ongoing dispute with a provider that we are contracting with which affects a service that we are seeing delivered in the borough um, and that we expect them to work with the unions on resolving that. Um, it, it would, it's more of a team you might want to come in on the procurement aspect of that mm -hmm. um, in keeping with both sort of our, our, our moral duty as you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. As Oh. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chair. I, I was just going to say that uh, I've uh, uh, been talking to the category lead for this area on that in that regard. So, following this, uh, the approval of this uh, report, uh, mm. supporting the process uh, of making sure that uh, the supplier will uh, work with us uh, to be able to uh, acknowledge that uh, trade union uh, if uh, staff needs to uh, wants to call on that support. So. That is, and we are happy to work with the service to take forward, uh, Chair. Cool, brilliant. Thanks, Ritimi. Um, And I just wanted to flag as well, um, it looks like we're missing some of the targets in the report. Um, so we've got, uh, I'm going to try and get the page numbers, uh, as I know we're doing it virtually, and it's more helpful to do it if we have the page number. So I think it's on um, page 41, I think we've got the KPIs. Um, within the report, that is, as opposed to the pack, is it 41 or is it 43? Uh, 41, and we don't seem to have those targets completed. Um, and likewise, we've got targets, page 47, um, around the sustainable procurement strategy, um, which, which appear to have the actual targets missing. Right, okay. Um... Would it be possible for those to come back as just to be noted at a future meeting so we have them on the record? Because I'm sure they're there, it's just that they've not made yeah. it into the paper. So. Definitely, yes. Of course, yes. Again, if you could just uh, work with uh, Dawn, uh, the category lead on that, and just mm -hmm. get that across back to yeah. uh, members, that would be helpful. Thank you. Brilliant. In which case, unless there are any further questions from colleagues, and I've not seen anyone indicating. Oh, Chair, I, I just wanted to comment, Chair, just to welcome this piece of work and thank officers for the um, input that's happened. I don't really have a comment, but it was more just uh, an acknowledgement that I I would hope that this pathway, and I suppose that's part of the reason why we're doing this, but I'm just thinking not just our most vulnerable, but some of our younger residents that will fall into these categories, having that single pathway will make a lot simpler. And I'm thinking about single pathway will be more supportive for them and maybe not so overwhelming as we go forward. So just wanted to acknowledge that and, and thank you for this piece of work really and, and, yeah. and members that have worked along with officers on this. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Can I just say something, Chair, uh, about the, um, so the young people's pathway and the adult pathway, um, we've been working across directorates and so um, the pathways mirror each other a lot. Uh, so that transition from YP to adult um, should be smooth.
All right, I'm shutting up now. Sorry, Chair. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> that was brilliant. Thank, thank, thank you. you so thank much. you so much. Um, brilliant. Any, I'm taking it, no final contributions. Uh, so, and I'm assuming we don't want to discuss the appendices. So can I ask everyone to unmute to agree the recommendations as set out? Agreed. 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 Brilliant. I've come to recognise, John, that there's a slight time lag on your agreed. So just, we add a pause at the end. Uh, brilliant. Thanks, Beverly. You're welcome Thank to you. stay. Um, also welcome to go. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Brilliant. Bye. Bye. Which brings us on uh, to item nine and uh, energy procurement business case. And we've got Mary Hi. here to introduce the paper. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Alagibola. I'm the energy manager for, for the council. Um, this report is really a review of our energy procurement strategy. And in this report, we're seeking approval um, on um, the, the energy procurement strategy, which is the strategy we currently run as well. But we're also seeking approval to change our public buying organization and also um, seeking approval for um, the delegated power to the group director of finance. Um, so I'll just start by introducing what the paper is about. Um, every few years, the council reviews its energy procurement strategy just to ensure that it's still sound and it's still relevant and it takes account of movements in the market or innovation in the energy industry. Um, and, part of, and as part of doing this review, what we also do um, to present the business case is to look at how we not essentially our buying strategy but also um, benchmark our procurement provider which is a um, what's referred to as the PBOs in this report so those are the public buying organizations um, so for a number of years um, we've continued to adopt a collaborative approach which looks like which looks at aggregating energy demand across a large number of baskets um, which is called energy baskets this agree um, power into a basket and takes advantage of the of the economy to buy you know energy at, in advance and at a cheaper rate potentially this approach is called the RICS managed flexible procurement purchase strategy is a mouthful but I thought I'll just read it all out in one so this is the current strategy that we we use um, on, on not unlike most local authorities um, and other public um, organizations as well this is the um, strategy that is recommended because of the fact that you can buy at periodic times in the market and you buy in advance and we tend to know our energy prices 12 months in advance we've reviewed um, obviously the prices um, year on year um, and we continue to deliver savings as opposed to buying directly or buying on the day and so we're um, we're suggesting that we continue with this approach and this type of approach is administered by um, public buying organizations. Um, currently, uh, potentially in, in London, there is two main ones, which is the CCS and laser. At the moment, we're with CCS, but what we've had to do as part of bringing this business case is to review the service that we get from, um, from CCS against the service, the potential service from laser. Um, and benchmark that from references again from other local authorities. Incidentally, um, of all the local authorities in London, at least 15 of them are with laser, so it was easy to be able to get some kind of comparisons and some benchmarks there. We also reviewed the prices as well, just to see, you know, in terms of the um, of the leverage prices um, that they would charge for the service, how that compares with CCS, and um, we've been able to conclude that we're potentially better off with um, with laser um, because in terms of the, the the level of service that laser potentially provides um, one of the ones that stands out for us as an organization is the ability to is it, potentially their immediate and long-term strategies for green energy which kind of lines up obviously with some of our strategy as well because we the council does have an ab ambition to not just buy electricity via regals but to buy it through power purchase agreements so laser has a framework um already set up which allows us to potentially buy not just um, long-term energy um by ppa but also short-term strategies as well so we're currently reviewing that 
but that opportunity is there. They also have the opportunity for us to purchase green gas certificates, which is pretty similar to what we do with um, regals and electricity. At the moment, it is cost prohibitive. It's, it's quite high. But what we will do is appraise that in line with our other energy strategies and the cost of doing some of our energy efficiency measures against buying green gas as well. Those are all the things that it's going on in the background. But the laser framework provides these opportunities for us because it's already there. So it is really for these main reasons that we've, we've, um, we've potentially are recommending laser. What it means for, for the service is essentially um, on the gas side, it's, it will be a smooth transition because laser has two, two frameworks at the moment. They've got a framework for electricity and a framework for gas. The framework for gas, um, which they call lot one, the current provider there is our current gas provider. So in terms of onboarding, it will be quite a smooth transition for us. On the electricity side, there will be an administrative burden on the, on the service just to onboard our supplies, because we've got our family supplies, we've got unmetered supplies, which goes on to like, things like street lighting, um, lamppost lighting, and we've also got non alpha supplies. So these supplies at the moment on the CCS, they are split across different types of providers. Of course, split across two providers. But on the laser, we have the added advantage that we just have one electricity provider for all those services. So there will be some you know, administrative burden in terms of just onboarding them, but we, we kind of get up for it and we're preparing for that. And we, but we, we recognize the long-term gain, so to speak. So um, that's really what this report, that's a summary of what's in this report. Um, and what we're seeking, um, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, is um, an approval that we can continue with the PIA strategy and also to elect LASER as a, as a um, public buying organization and to give the group director of finance um, delegates to, to be able to exercise his delegated authority to engage um, the PBO LASER for another three years. Um, for further contracts for a three-year period, which is what we've, we've done to, to date. Um, but we will still bring yearly contract award reports um, to the procurement committee. And so that summarizes, um, yeah, the reports. And I'm happy to field any questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Mary. Um, and I should flag there are two exempt appendices that go with this report. Clifford, can I just right. check the governance point? Have we strayed? Because uh, we were mentioning providers there, have we strayed into the appendix? We within that? I don't think we have, Chair. No, um, but I think if members do wish to ask any further questions regarding the exempt appendices, then we will have to go into part two. Thank you. Okay. So we'll, just, we'll, we'll take that as, as noted. Um, Councillor Burke, I was assuming you might like to. Come in on this. Um, can you hear me, Chair? I can. Yep. Okay, um, obviously I've been through this paper with the officers, um, so the only thing I'd like to say is once again thanks for both Ratimi and Mary's ongoing work in this area to help the administration achieve its uh, goals of decarbonising its uh, wholesale energy supply and this is uh, another kind of reassuring step in that direction, so thank you to the officers who put in so much hard work into this paper. Yeah, again, it's a really strong paper. So uh, just to echo Councillor Burke's thanks. Uh, so no questions from me. Any questions from colleagues? No, in which case are we OK to unmute and agree the recommendations as set out? Agreed. 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 Right, thank you. Agreed. Brilliant. Thanks, Mary. You're welcome to stay to the end, which will be very quick. From now on in, you're also welcome to go. Brilliant. So we've just got the final bits of the meeting to take care of. Um, so we have item 10. We have no other unrestricted business that we consider to be urgent. Can we note the dates of future meetings at item 11? We don't need to exclude the press and public. At item 12 because we're not going to discuss any of the exempt items uh, and we just agree though the exempt minutes of cabinet procurement committee on 6th of July agreed agreed brilliant the exempt appendices are noted and we have no items of exempt urgent business which brings us to an end of the meeting thank you all thank you chair thank you very thank much you.
Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Have a nice evening, everyone. Take care all.